Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. And we begin with question number one from Ross Greer. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to encourage the SFA and football clubs to follow the lead of the English FA in adopting the principles of the Rooney Rule for future coaching appointments. Minister Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Uh, we are absolutely determined that people from all backgrounds are involved in football and sport generally at all levels, reflecting the diversity of modern Scotland. We want our national game to be more diverse and there is no doubt more can be done, particularly to improve representation in key roles. I want to see more BME players and coaches in the game and I want to see other groups represented too. And I've met and I've discussed with the SFA how more progress can be made so Scottish football can be held up worldwide as a game where all are welcome. I welcome and support the good work undertaken by Halla Usta, Diversity Inclusion Manager at the SFA. Halla is an established and well-respected campaigner for equality, diversity and sports in a number of areas. And I'll continue to work closely with her at the SFB, as well as with the SPFL clubs and all other partners to promote equality and diversity in football and all other sports. Ross Greer. I thank the Minister for that answer. The first black football player, first black international player, played for Scotland in 1881. Since then, we've come a long way in the diversity of our football teams, but not particularly far in the diversity of football management. Where the Rooney Rule has been implemented, it has been very successful. In the NFL in America, it's increased the proportion of black and Hispanic management from 6% to 20%. It doesn't require a quota. It simply requires that an opportunity for interview is given to at least one BME candidate. So could I ask the Minister again if the Scottish Government support the principle of the Rooney Rule? Minister. Yeah, uh, and I'm aware that the English FA recently announced that it will be introduced in the Rooney Rule across its national setup later this year. And I'm in extremely interested in the outcome of that. And I know that Scottish FA will consider if lessons can be learned. Now, nothing will be ruled out. However, we need to ensure that any measures we introduce in Scotland are based on Scottish circumstances and what would be most effective here. Again, I would highlight the role and work of Halla Usta, who has done an awful lot of uh, work uh, in and around the SFA to promote uh, diversity and equality. And also want to update uh, the member that it is the SFA's intention to implement positive action measures that will build on the capacity of underrepresented coaches through relevant training and qualifications to allow them an equal opportunity to apply uh, for roles uh, in the future. And again, they're happy to continue to engage with the member uh, and keep them updated on the areas of progress that the work uh, that we're doing in the SFA, but also more generally. David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer, and could I refer members to my register of interest as unpaid chair of Inverness Caledonian Thistle Trust. Um, as Ross Grew has made it clear, the Rooney Rule originates from the American NFL, which requires teams to interview at least one ethnic minority candidate for every head coach vacancy. And as we've heard, this has been adopted by the English FA. I believe this is an idea whose time has come, and will the Minister write to the SFA to encourage them to adopt the principle in Scotland, not least for the international manager vacancy. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm sure that's vexing the people at the SFA as they seek to find a, a new manager. And also, though, we'd want to pay tribute, though I know that uh, Dave Stewart did mention that he has a role within the community trusts. And I think that is an area of football that is not very well reflected in the wider uh, press. I think the work that our clubs do, the trusts do to promote many of the issues that we described uh, today uh, should get much more coverage and publicity because of the uh, uh, key role that they play in our communities. In terms of the specifics around the the Rooney Rule, you know, I again I remain interested to see the outcomes of some of the uh, uh, information and, and research that's happening around the Rooney Rule. Uh, and again, as I said to Ross Greer, nothing will be ruled out, but we need to make sure, though, that any measures that we introduce in Scotland are based on Scottish circumstances and what would be most effective here and are impactful and achieve the desired outcome that I think we all want to see, which is far more diversity in our game uh, and our, at all rungs of the ladder. Again, I would say that you know, we continue to work closely with the SFA, the SPFL, the clubs and other partners to continue to promote uh, equality and diversity. And that's the specific uh, role of Halla Usta, who has achieved an awful lot. And again, you know, despite the fact that the SFA's intention is to implement positive action measures that would build on the capacity of underrepresented coaches through relevant training and qualifications. So I think there's a whole host of different areas of work that's been uh, taken forward by the SFA and others to promote that diversity that we need to see. But again, you know, I'll continue to uh, engage with the, the member on this issue and continue to keep him updated as uh, work on this progresses. Question number two, Neil Findlay. 
Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to provide care for children who experience ill health. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. The Scottish Government funds NHS Scotland to provide a range of services to promote and protect the health of children. <coughs> Hospital, general practice and nursing services provide ongoing health care to children with illnesses ranging from minor to more serious long-term medical problems. Neil Findlay. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, since July, 414 sick and seriously ill children have been transferred from St John's to the Royal Hospital for sick children, with 341 admitted because their local hospital ward was closed to admissions at that time. Uh, I am hearing uh, weekly harrowing stories from parents of desperately ill children, and they have had enough of excuse after excuse. So on their behalf, can I ask you to provide us with a timescale, the timescale that you and NHS Lothian are working to to get the ward at St John's fully operational as a 24-7 service. Cabinet Secretary. Well, in the interest of the, the, the children that uh, Neil Finlay has mentioned, the, the timescale is as soon as possible. And I want to take the opportunity uh, to, to give an update. Obviously, as Neil Finlay and other members know, NHS Lothian uh, took uh, the step because of safety concerns, but they have been working extremely hard uh, to address recruitment in this area. Uh, and of course, a 24-7 paediatric service at St John's Hospital is the preferred option for NHS Lothian. And as Neil Finlay also knows, the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health report in the autumn of 2017 endorsed NHS Lothian's aim uh, to maintain that service. But of course, they recognised that the recruitment issues were significant. So what NHS Lothian have been doing is quite extensive in terms of their recruitment campaign. They've confirmed that the medical team in uh, paediatric and patient services at St John's is increasing. A consultant who was recruited at the end of last year has now joined the team. The sixth and most recent recruitment campaign, so this is the sixth recruitment campaign, which ended last week, was successful and an offer has been made to another candidate, which when finalised would take the total to seven. I'm sure Neil Finlay is aware that NHS Lothian is working to recruit eight additional consultants as well as strengthening the number of advanced nurse practitioners in order to support children's services both at St John's and of course the Royal Hospital for Sick Children in Edinburgh. So what I would say is good progress has been made on the recruitment and I would hope that Neil Finlay would welcome that. Wilton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer, and I'd remind the Chamber and the PLO to the Health Secretary. A recent Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health report has shown that Scotland is ahead of the rest of the UK on progress being made in children's health. Can the Cabinet Secretary comment on what political commitments this government has made to build on improvements already made? Cabinet Secretary. Yes, uh, I was very pleased to see that the Royal College uh, report had cited uh, a number of policies that have been taken forward uh, in Scotland to ensure that uh, children's health uh, is at the, the core uh, of uh, the policies, not just in health, but across other government uh, policies as well. Uh, I think uh, particularly the investment in health visitor numbers and in, uh, investment in expanding that workforce ensures that in the early years, the best start is made uh, for children's uh, lives. And of course, we are uh, on track to deliver uh, an increase in the number of health visit visitors in Scotland by 500 by the end of uh, 2018. That is an unprecedented 50% increase in the number of health visitors but uh, it was a very very positive report as far as Scotland's concerned and one that we should be proud of. Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you presiding officer. Around uh, 450 infants, children and young people die in Scotland every year. Many of these deaths are entirely preventable. In light of this I would like to ask the Scottish Government if it intends to take the advice of the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health and create a system to ensure child deaths are properly reviewed. Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> yeah. Well, obviously, there's already uh, systems in place to review uh, any death through the uh, significant adverse event review process. Uh, but there is work going on specifically around uh, child deaths, which has been taken forward by Aileen Campbell, uh, which is very, very important. I think um, if there are 
any preventable deaths, and of course it covers uh, many issues like, uh, like accidents, for example, and what more could be done in the preventative uh, arena. And if there is anything more this government can do uh, around that, then of course those steps will be taken. Happy for Aileen Campbell to write to the member with an update of the progress being made. And Neil Bibby. Yesterday, I asked the Cabinet Secretary whether she would come to Paisley to explain her decision to close the children's ward at the RAH directly to parents affected. The Cabinet Secretary failed to accept that invitation. People can't have confidence in the Health Secretary's decision if she doesn't have confidence to defend it to local parents. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary again today, will she come to Paisley and explain her decision directly to parents affected, or will she snub them again? Well, the most important thing about the decision is getting on with the implementation of that decision. And what's important there is that the families that are given the reassurance by those providing the care and treatment to their children that the new arrangements are safer and are well supported uh, by those clinicians who treat their children. And importantly, that they've to help address and overcome any concerns that have been expressed by the families to ensure that through the individual care plans that they have that need to be in place before this change happens, uh, that those uh, concerns are addressed and reassurances are given. That should be the priority. And I hope that Neil Bibby and other members will encourage those families to engage with their health professionals to make that happen. That's the most responsible thing that Neil Bibby could do in this situation. And I hope that's what he will do. Question number three, Claudia Beamish. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that the sporting facilities at Ravenscraig in Motherwell and others used by people in the south of Scotland region will be maintained in their present form. Minister Eileen Campbell. Thank you. I was extremely concerned to hear about the potential reduction in facilities for sporting communities and residents in North Lanarkshire and beyond, particularly as North Lanarkshire leisure will continue to benefit from charity relief from non-domestic rates following a recent reduction of the recommendation from the external Barclay Review to end this. I asked the Chief Executive of Sport Scotland to engage directly with North Lanarkshire Leisure on this matter and I can confirm that the Chief Executive of Sport Scotland has now spoken to the Chief Executive of North Lanarkshire Council who has now agreed to pause on any decision making on Ravens Craig until all parties, uh, relevant parties are around the table. As MSP for Clydesdale, though, I also maintain a constituency interest on the issue given the number of cons my constituents who use this regional sporting facility and have made my own representations on that basis. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, um, and I welcome the comments of the, the Minister. However, the concern of law and district amateur athletics is that a significant part of the indoor facilities at Ravens Craig Centre are likely to be cut and impacting on both our community's fitness and happiness and welfare and opportunities for developing elite athletes. The importance of the indoor training facilities will not be lost on anyone in this chamber uh, weather-wise. If the proposed cuts in the Scottish Government's draft budget to council funding are implemented, these facilities will be jeopardised and the legacy of the Glasgow Commonwealth Games to promote athletics will be lost if the facilities are not available. Can the Minister tell me why the strat what the strategy is to ensure local sporting facilities are at the centre of Scotland's health and wellbeing? Minister. Well, can I just uh, remind the member that it was Sports Scotland that invested over three, £7 million in North Lanarkshire uh, Council in 2008, and that was to provide a regional sporting facility as part of the strategy for Scotland with the aim of developing a network of multi-sports facilities right across uh, Scotland through that partnership approach. Again, though, I just want to reiterate that I, I asked and I sought the uh, uh, engagement of the Chief Executive of Sports Scotland to engage directly with North Lanarkshire Leisure, and through that action, North Lanarkshire Council have now agreed to pause on the decision-making on Ravens Craig until all relevant parties are around uh, the table. I'm very well aware uh, through representations made to m myself by Law and District Athletics uh, Club about the importance in which they attach uh, the facility that they have at Ravens Craig. So too the many representations I've received from other athletics bodies across um, uh, Lanarkshire and beyond because of that regional role that that particular facility uh, fills uh, in Scotland and I think that's the basis by which Sports Scotland will engage in all the relevant partners around the table to make sure that we can get a successful way forward but again you know I was extremely concerned to hear about the reduction of facilities for those sporting communities particularly because of the good progress that we've made in legacy the significant progress in legacy after the 2014 Commonwealth Games uh, and again I'll continue to keep members who have an interest updated 
noted, but I am uh, very pleased that Chief Executive of Sports Scotland has managed to uh, seek and get a pause on this decision until there is further uh, work carried out. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, this is primarily a decision for the Labour-controlled Council Alio, North Lanarkshire Leisure. Does the Minister agree with me that consideration going forward, it is absolutely vital that decisions take into account the inclusivity of activities and the impact that any decision has on the desired effect of maximising sport uptake for all? Minister. It, absolutely, again, the, uh, that's why it is a uh, positive that uh, Sports Scotland, uh, because of that significant investment that had gone into North Lanarkshire Council back in 2008, that, that uh, is, uh, he, they have managed to facilitate a meeting to convene uh, everybody who has an interest on this issue around the table to work out a way forward. Because um, I understand that there are issues around um, uh, the, the financial uh, element of athletics participation in Ravenscraig, uh, but that shouldn't be the only driver in a regional facility uh, like this. There should be an opportunity for all sports to be able to access these uh, good sporting facilities that we have in Scotland because of that significant public investment that has gone in, and I'll continue to keep the member updated with the constituency interest that she has on how those discussions progress. Brian Whittle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, given that Ravenscraig facility receives, received significant public funds, can I ask the Scottish Government what protocols are in place to ensure that usage uh, of the facility matches the investment application and at the time of the application there was a plan in place to maximise the usage of the facility for the purpose for which it was designed? Minister. Well, uh, Sports Scotland continue to take a real uh, uh, interest uh, in the operation of the regional facilities that are around the country, and that's why, in this particular instance, Sports Scotland have uh, engaged those so thoroughly on the issue to ensure that we can secure, secure uh, access for all sports uh, of this regional facility because of that significant interest, uh, uh, the investment they have put in uh, nearly uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and, you know, I think... You know, given that we took the decision that we did to reject that particular recommendation from the Barclay Review, it is really disappointing and concerning uh, to hear of uh, North Lanarkshire Leisure's uh, potential proposals uh, and also the real feeling from so many of the local athletics clubs that they don't feel that they've been properly engaged in this process. So again, you know, that's why it's important that we uh, await the uh, progression of the meeting that will be convened by Sports Scotland to engage all the relevant partners. Question for Rona Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it's had with the UK Government regarding introducing a safe injection room for drug users in, in Glasgow. Minister Aidan Campbell. Um, following advice from the Lord Advocate on Glasgow's proposals, I wrote to the UK Government's Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Crime Safeguarding and Vulnerability on the 9th of November uh, last year, requesting a meeting to discuss devolving powers to the Scottish Parliament that would allow Glasgow to progress its proposal for a safer injecting facility and I await a response to that request. However, at the end of a Westminster debate last week, the UK government said that they had no intention of supporting this proposal or devolving the necessary powers. Now, I urge them to reconsider, particularly in light of the specific public health needs in Glasgow. Rona Mackay. Thank the Minister for that answer. Given that these projects have proved successful elsewhere in reducing harm, such as preventing increases in HIV infection rates, does she agree with me that if and when these powers come to Scotland, we should introduce safe rooms for addicts as quickly as is practicable? Minister. Thank you. I agree that there is a absolutely evidence that safer injecting facilities are successful in reducing harm for people who inject drugs. Importantly, they also uh, offer an, a real opportunity to engage with a specific population who may not ordinarily use existing treatment and support services. And if we had the relevant powers, we could consider any business case to introduce such a facility based on its merits, particularly in areas uh, where there is a clear public health need. Question number five, Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it's doing to support women's football and rugby. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Scottish Government is a strong supporter of women and girls football and rugby and recognises the strong contribution it makes to encouraging women and girls participation as well as raising uh, Scotland's profile on the international stage. We work closely with the SFA, Scottish Women's Football, Scottish Rugby and many other partners to raise the profile of the women's game and provide support and investment throughout, uh, through Sports Scotland. Also, both sports are represented on the Women and Girls Sport Advisory Board that I established uh, in September last year. Julian Martin. 
thank the Minister for that answer. I must declare family interest is my niece Ellis Martin's and under 19 Scotland Sevens International and I asked her to ask her teammates what issue they'd like me to raise with you and they wanted to ask with women's rugby and football becoming more popular it makes sense that the women's games are able to reach a wider audience. Given that a new BBC Scotland television channel is due to be launched, has the Minister had any discussions with them about how women's rugby and football will be better represented on television? Minister. Uh, thank you, and uh, I wish, and I'm sure everybody wishes her niece very well in her rugby career. Uh, it's a game that I've recently taken up, so if she's got any hints and tips to give to me, I'd be very welcome uh, of them. Um, given... Uh, uh, that she has raised that particular issue. I think it's a very important issue around uh, raising the profile. I absolutely agree with the member on this issue and would warmly welcome more television coverage for women's rugby and football. And we are absolutely determined to raise the profile of women's sport to help increase participation and any steps by broadcasters to support this uh, would be warmly welcomed. And I will explore this issue directly along with my uh, colleague, uh, the Cabinet Secretary, Fiona Hislop, and consider what steps could be taken. But the member may wish to know that I met recently uh, with the Director of Strategy and Partnership at MG Alaba last year and we discussed the channel's strong commitment to women's football. BBC Alaba currently supports both women's football and rugby and I hope that support continues into the new BBC Scotland television channel. Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Borders has a rich and strong rugby history. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that efforts to help more women like Scotland player Lisa Thompson from Hoyt to take up rugby as part of a healthy and active lifestyle would be welcome and also to support schools and clubs at grassroots level to break down the barriers and overcome the challenges in order to promote rugby as a game for young girls as well as boys is essential? Yes. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, of course, I think the whole of the country recognises the real strong link that the Borders does have uh, with rugby. And certainly as we uh, prepare to uh, look at the Six Nations with a very optimistic looking Scotland's team, I'm sure that will again inspire more people to take up the sport. Also, though, uh, it, what it should do is because this, the Six Nations Women's Tournament will also be uh, happening, that again should give uh, an opportunity to raise the profile for girls in, one, in a sport that is really fast growing. It was one of the sports that we highlighted in our uh, Women and Girls uh, Sports Week uh, last year as a real key area of strength. And certainly, if, uh, I think the member, I'm not sure if the member was at the SRU reception last week in Parliament, we heard many stories about how important the club structure for rugby is in terms of promoting the game. Uh, I'm sure she'll be very well aware of many of the clubs that she represents in her region. Uh, certainly I know in my own area as well how important that club structure is. The, the real nurturing, the care, the attention that they provide to young uh, sports uh, stars of the future, both girls and boys, to ensure that in the future we will have uh, a structure and a number of players to continue the sense of optimism that we have in our current rugby squads. Mary Fee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Only one woman sits on the SFA Board of Directors and only one woman sits on the SRU Board of Directors. And I'm sure the Minister is aware that positive role models can have a significant impact. So what will the Minister do to improve and promote female participation at board level, which would have the knock-on effect of improving sporting participation? Minister. It, I, again, I thank the uh, member for the uh, question. And I think linking back to the question that Ross Greer asked earlier, I think there in that way she's presented that question, she recognises and articulates a real area that is needing uh, improvement, particularly, uh, I think, uh, in the SFA, because I think there is opportunity uh, in the SRU with the Vice President, Dee Bradbury, who uh, will be president of the SRU later uh, this year, who will be the one, I think, the first woman in that tier of rugby to be a hold up presidential position. I think she certainly realises the real opportunity that she has in that position to make greater strides forward in terms of increasing the participation of girls and women playing rugby, but also being involved in the setup and the structures of rugby. And I think there's opportunity to, pro, you know, to potentially push forward the same agenda uh, in football uh, as well. But uh, Dee Bradbury, for the member's interest, sits on our Women and Girls Advisory Board because of that uh, significant role that she plays in rugby to help advise us on what more we can do to ensure that women participate in sport, girls participate in sport, but also get those opportunities to uh, establish themselves within the, the operating structures of sport, regardless of whether it's football or rugby, I think there's a real need for us to do far more uh, to have women represented in all rungs of sport. Question number six, Jenny Ruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what proposals it has to reduce waiting times in hospitals next winter. Minister, Esther, Cabinet Secretary, Sean Robinson. 
Well, first, I'd like to thank health and social care staff for the tremendous contribution they are making to maintain safe patient care this winter. And although we have seen exceptional pressures on a &E services across Scotland, eight out of 10 patients were seen treated and discharged or admitted within the four hour target. And performance in the latest week uh, ending 14th of January was 85.8%. We routinely review winter each year so that we can learn lessons from what went well and identify areas for improvement. Uh, I should also add that NHS Fife received £1.36 million from the £22.4 million allocated to NHS boards this year to help prepare for winter. Jay Gilruth. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. The latest figures from NHS Fife show that only 81.4% of planned operations were seen within the 18-week initial referral to treatment time guidelines. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm what guidance she will provide to NHS Fife to ensure that this issue is addressed? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I've made £15 million available to NHS Scotland specifically to reduce waiting times for hospital planned care in the current financial year, with NHS Fife receiving £3.4 million of this funding. This funding will reduce weights across the whole patient pathway, outpatient diagnostics and for inpatient and day case treatment. And I expect Fife and all other boards to make improvements uh, by the, the spring of this year. Uh, this funding and the work of the Access Collaborative, which is being led by uh, Professor Derek Bell, should, see, uh, should support significant improvement in delivering the 18-week referral to treatment time in NHS Fife uh, during this year and elsewhere in Scotland also. Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. Short staffing was the root cause of a lot of the problems we saw in hospitals across Scotland this winter. There are currently 3,000 vacant nursing posts in Scotland, a shortfall which I believe can be directly linked to Nicola Sturgeon's decision to cut nurse training places in 2012. So can the Cabinet Secretary tell Parliament how will she ensure this shortfall is reduced by next winter? Secretary. Well, can, first of all, can I remind uh, Miles Briggs that we have a huge expansion programme of nurse training, 2,600 training places uh, over the course of this parliament, uh, which will be important in expanding uh, the workforce. Uh, and of course, we are recruiting uh, more nurses. We um, also, though, uh, recognise that some of the measures we've taken have put us in a very strong position. So, for example, we have retained the bursary uh, and support for student nurses and midwives. Uh, if you look at what has happened south of the border because of the loss of both of those funding streams. Well, but Miles Briggs is in, his party's in charge south of the border and has made decisions that has shown, has shown a huge reduction in nurses. If you'd watched the BBC over the last few weeks, you'll have seen the crisis in nursing south of the border. So you can't be in charge in one part of the UK where nurse recruitment is in crisis and come here and accuse the Scottish Government of not doing enough to recruit and retain nurses. I have laid out the plans for the recruitment and retention of nurses. 2,600 extra uh, places for uh, training nurses and midwives. That is a huge investment, over £40 million of investment. That will go a long way to making sure that we can reduce uh, reliance on agency nurses and indeed um, make sure that we can recruit to those substantive posts. And Anna Sauer. Uh, back in Scotland and back in the real world, presenting officer, uh, can I start by thanking, uh, joining the Cabinet Secretary and thanking all our NHS staff who have been going above and beyond over the winter uh, period. Uh, but the reality is this is not just a challenge during winter. We have problems meeting our waiting times all year round and those challenges are put under the microscope over the winter period. And there's three ways to reduce our waiting times. One is to adequately fund our NHS. And the reality is over the next four years, there are 1.5 billion pounds of cuts that health wards will be making. It's adequately staffing our wards, but we currently have three and a half thousand nursing and midwifery vacancies. And it's also having appropriate local services, meaning saving services like the REH paediatric ward, and instead transferring those to an already overstretched Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that her rhetoric doesn't meet with her decisions and what action will she take? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, uh, uh, Anna Sarwar seems to have forgotten the fact that we're talking about the brand new Royal Hospital for Children. Uh, not the Queen Elizabeth, but the Royal Hospital for Children. Brand new state of that hospital. I thought you would have known that that now exists 
as a brand new state-of-the-art hospital for children that we would expect to uh, and uh, who's actually the performance of that hospital is fantastic if you look at its A&E performance I think it was around about 98 percent over the, the last uh, uh, published figures. Uh, so it does have the capacity. Um, there are no issues with the capacity at that hospital. It has adequate beds and is able to provide a first-class service. And I would have thought Anna Sarwar, Anna Sarwar saying a new state-of-the-art children's hospital doesn't provide a first-class service. No. That is absolutely outrageous no. that you'd be talking no. down no. our state-of-the-art yes. first-class hospital that has been, has been absolutely has been held up as one of the best children's hospitals in the United Kingdom. Instead of talking down that hospital, Order, you should be please. talking up the hospital, given it's one of your local hospitals, Anna Sarwar. I find that quite shocking. Absolutely. In terms of funding, let me address funding. Uh, £2 billion more funding over the course of this Parliament for the NHS. That is far more than the Labour Party offered in your manifesto. There is no budget proposals coming from your party to put more money into the NHS for 18-19. If Anna Sarra wants to come forward with a budget amendment that puts more money than we're going to put into the NHS, then we would be interested to see that. But you've brought forward nothing. So you come to this place and argue for more money, but you're not prepared to come forward with budget amendments that deliver that money. So we will continue to fund the NHS to record levels. There are more staff than ever before working in the NHS. So we'll continue to put the resources into the NHS and we'll leave Labour just to snipe from the sidelines. Question seven, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to correct the £165 million discrepancy in NHS Grampians funding, which the Scottish Parliament Information Centre has suggested has arisen because the Board's NRAC funding targets have not been met since 2009. Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, NHS Grampian will receive a resource budget uplift of 2.1% in. 2018-19, uh, the highest percentage uplift of any territorial board, and this includes a £5 million share of additional NRAC parity funding and takes the board's annual resource budget to £921 million. The Scottish Government has invested significantly in supporting boards that are behind parity and over a seven-year period has committed an additional £1.2 billion to those boards that are below their NRAC parity levels. In 2018-19, all boards will be within 0.8% of NRAC parity. NHS Grampian will have received additional funding of £52 million since 2015-16 for the specific purpose of accelerating NRAC parity. Mike Rumbles. Cabinet Secretary, over the last nine years, herself and her predecessor have consistently underfunded Grampian Health Board in their own targets. Grampian Health Board is already the lowest funded health board in the country by the Scottish Government's targets and therefore to underfund it again and in this year it's underfunded by £12 million is not satisfactory. Does the, does the Cabinet Secretary feel that this is a... Is she satisfied with this level of, of funding for Grampian Health Board and will she like to explain if she is satisfied with it to all those people who are waiting for planned operations that have been cancelled and those people at accident and emergency who have to wait over eight hours and 12 hours to be seen. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, what I would encourage uh, Mike Rumbles to do is to perhaps uh, occasionally turn up to the briefings that are provided by NHS Grampian to local members, because at those briefings, important information about funding to NHS Grampian, as was given at the last meeting, as I understand it, would have helped Mike Rumbles to better understand the funding position of NHS Grampian. Uh, let me just say this as well. Given that year-to-year -year movements in the NRAC target allocations, it would have not been appropriate or possible to move NHS Grampian or any other board below parity to absolute parity because this would require an equivalent reduction in funding for those boards such as NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, NHS Borders, NHS Dumfries and Galloway and NHS Western Isles um, that are above parity. Now, if what Mike Rumbles is saying 
that money should have been stripped out of those boards and given to Grampian over a single year, that would not have been fair or appropriate. That would not have been a responsible thing to do. The NRAC formula works by bringing about a gradual movement in the funding of those boards that are below parity. The Scottish Government is supporting all boards behind parity. As I said in my initial uh, answer, we've committed an additional £1.2 billion pounds, <coughs> excuse me, over a seven-year period to those boards below their NRAC parity levels. Importantly, they are all now within 0.8% of parity. That is the closest to parity that we have ever been. And I would have thought Mike Rumbles might have welcomed that. Question 8, Peter Chapman. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made to add malignant melanoma to the Detect Cancer Early Programme. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the Scottish Government's Detect Cancer Early Programme is supporting five pilot projects focusing on improvements in the early diagnosis of malignant melanoma across five NHS boards. These pilots are due to report at the end of March 2018 when the Detect Cancer Early Programme Board will consider these reports and the potential to scale up any projects for regional and national activity. The Scottish Government has reinforced its commitment to earlier diagnosis and treatment outlined in Beating Cancer, Ambition and Action. This cancer strategy and accompanying £100 million of investment serves as a blueprint for the future of cancer services in Scotland and aims to improve the prevention, detection, diagnosis, treatment and aftercare for people who may be suspected to have or have com a confirmed diagnosis of cancer of any type. Peter Chapman. Aye, the, the DETECT Cancer Early Programme was launched in 2012, focusing on long breast and colorectal cancers. Between 2012 and 2016, there were 882 recorded mortalities from malignant melanoma in Scotland. And the Grampian Health Board covering my constituency with the fourth highest rate with 79. Cancer early diagnosis rates have failed to increase enough to meet the government target. So can the Cabinet Secretary commit to adding malignant melanoma to the programme and raise its early detection targets and therefore hope to reduce mortalities. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, the, the member raises an important point, and of course we have seen a, an increase in the instances of malignant melanoma um, since uh, in 2015. Uh, there were 1,363 diagnoses of melanoma. That's a 36.6% increase on incidence over the last 10 years. Now, we know a lot of the reasons for that, as I'm sure the member uh, will uh, appreciate. Um, what's important is what we do about it. And the Detect Cancer Early Programme Board, uh, as I indicated in my first answer, agreed at an options appraisal process to look at the potential to include additional tumour groups into the, uh, the DC, uh, DCE programme. Following this process, it was agreed to consider malignant melanoma as the next tumour type of interest in the programme. Clinical consensus was uh, that a, a large-scale public awareness campaign wouldn't be beneficial and that funding should focus on improvements in the existing diagnostic pathways to ensure that those most at risk were prioritised as requiring urgent assessment. So boards were invited to bid for funding to develop those local tests of change projects for delivery. And as I said, that will be reporting in March 2018. So what I'm happy to do is once that reports, I can write to the member with what that says and then we will take action there after, depending on what the, the report tells us. Nine, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how it measures the performance of NHS boards to ensure that they deliver the highest quality services for the populations that they serve. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. <clears throat> uh, NHS board performance is measured using a broad range of measures, including those contained within the local delivery plan standards, the hospital scorecard, and the Winter NHS Service uh, Weekly Suite. Measures include important areas such as healthcare associated infections, waiting times, activity, delayed discharge, patient safety, and flu consultations. And I'd be happy, I'd be happy to provide a comprehensive list of the measures that we currently use if the member would find that helpful. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Government entrusts health boards with more than 13 billion pounds of public money each year. And more importantly than that, we entrust them with serving the health needs of the people of Scotland. Can I ask what processes are in place to ensure that any performance gaps at health boards are identified and managed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we do that in a number of ways on an ongoing basis. Um, 
the uh, officials in the Scottish Government work with their counterparts and uh, local boards and indeed in the, uh, the health and social care partnerships. So, for example, our uh, finance uh, official, uh, Director of Finance, will work uh, with the Director of Finances in the local boards to make sure on financial performance that the boards are setting out their plans, are meeting key milestones and achieving their targets. Likewise, on performance, um, work is laid out in terms of the plans that we would expect boards to deliver, not least for the funding that we put in specifically for uh, like the 50 million for uh, reducing waiting times. And in addition to all of that ongoing um, monitoring, we would have obviously the annual appraisal, uh, which is either led by officials or by ministers to ensure that there's a public accountability um, on an annual basis for the money that the, the public uh, puts into funding an NHS. I think they're entitled to know how that's spent. Thank you. Can I thank the ministers and members for their contributions? That concludes portfolio questions.